Amen. Thank you, Mara, for uh, sharing that very moving um, and very powerful story of, of God's forgiveness, God's grace. It doesn't matter what we experience. God's grace, as I'll often say, is like water. It just runs to that lowest point. So I hope that at very least encourages you with whatever you're wrestling with uh, today. Well, we've re reached week number three of our Kindness Project series, and, and today the message is entitled, When Killing with Kindness kills. Now, let's be honest. We don't stand in much danger, right, of literally being killed by kindness. Kindness is a language the deaf can hear, the blind can see. As Corey said last week, it's a superpower. It basically touches everyone, kindness. But that said, it is possible for kindness to be deadly. So today, I want to explore how being kind and only kind can harm you. How pursuing kindness on its own actually puts the brakes on the divine kind. Now remember what we said in week number one, the divine kind is the kindness that God showed. The God in his kindness basically declared a temporary truce on our wrong in order to give us the opportunity to acknowledge it and to turn towards him. So God isn't kind simply for kindness' sake. God is kind for a purpose. In a sense, then, our kindness is deadly when it ignores the divine purpose behind kindness. Some people have said, well, I'm wondering in this series, is it really going to be light? Today isn't going to be light. We're going to go into some truths about God and His character and His holiness that actually are the fuel in the fire of our kindness, and that when we omit this from our story, from our minds, when we refuse to wrestle with them, we actually dampen the power of God's kindness. There are two thoughts I've got with us today, and we're going to end with a challenge for us to grow in these two areas, and we'll end with communion. Hopefully, you had your communion cup with you. Uh, you've got that when you come in. If you need to jump out and go and get one, that's fine. And uh, when you finish with those, by the way, you can just drop them into the, into the pews there, the holes, they, they'll fit perfectly. But the message today is really driven around two thoughts, but this is the foundational thought. Our kindness is deadly when we divorce it from its divine purpose. I want to start with a confession. This is a legitimate confession. I confess that I often be guilty of being too comfortable with God's kindness. My comfort is shown, for example, by my inner peace with my own character defects. That sometimes I'll know that there's uh, something that God is shining his light on in my life, and rather than deal with it because God is revealing this to me, I just go comfortable with it and I'll just push it off. In other words, I do that partly because of a theology that actually magnifies God's kindness and kind of limits his holiness. There's a, a sense in which I know I'm comfortable with God's kindness when God's judgment of wrong actually shocks me. For example, uh, Acts chapter 5 is a passage of Scripture that no matter <laughs> that I know what's happening, no matter that the theology in my head is right, I, I know what's going on. It, whenever I read Acts chapter 5, I'm shocked. Emotionally, I'm just shocked. I, again, my head gets it but I'm shocked. Are you shocked by Acts 5? Let's look at, look at that text. This is what we read. But, so whenever a passage starts with, with the but here, it's because something happened in the previous chapter. Okay? In Acts chapter 4, God started to work powerfully on the early church, marked by the fact that people would just be incredibly generous. And there was one guy that stood out from all the rest, and he was Barnabas. He pretty much sold everything, laid it at the apostles' feet, and said, you know what, I'm, I'm basically all in. And 
he was so revered in the church that a number of people wanted to follow his example for the right way, but this couple followed his example, but with impure motives. As we read this, let me ask you, have you ever done the right thing with impure motives? I have. I think all of us have, and that's why this shocks me. So this but here, it's a, it's a big one, because quite honestly, this could be us. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold some land. He kept back part of the money for himself. His wife knew about it and agreed to it. But he brought the rest of the money and gave it to the apostles. Peter said, Ananias, why did you let Satan rule your thoughts to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep for yourself part of the money that you received for the land? Before you sold the land, it belonged to you. And even after you sold it, you could have used the money any way that you wanted. Why did you think of doing this? You lied to God, not to us. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Some young men came in. You know what young men came in means? Probably really young. Look at what they did. Wrapped up his body and carried it out. I mean, this, this kind of is told as if it's no shock to the thing at all, right? Can you imagine what it would be like for some of our kids to walk in and roll up somebody who just dropped dead at the front of the church and then carry him out and bury him? Does it shock you? It shocks me. No wonder the passage ends and everyone who heard about this was filled with fear. Yeah? Yeah, I get it. This passage displays God judging Ananias and later his wife Sapphira's sin immediately and severely. Immediately and severely. Now, there's a parallel account, by the way, in Joshua chapter 7, which talks about the sin of Achan. What's interesting is that both of these stories in Joshua and in Acts 5 occur at the beginning of a new move of God. It's as if God wants to show people how important it is for them to continue their journey into holiness. Don't forget this. It's as if God wanted to put down a marker right at the beginning of the church's journey and indicate how holy he is. And so if God's kindness led, leads him to push back judgment, then theologically we know that God's holiness proclaims that that judgment will come and is the reason and the foundation upon which that judgment is executed. There's two sides of God's character and God's nature, and somehow God is able to be fully kind and loving and at the same time fully holy. But make no mistake, judgment will come. Warren Wiersbe wrote a book, Meeting God in the Psalms. And in that book, he, he tells a story of a frontier town back in the Midwest when a horse bolted and ran away with a wagon. And in that wagon, there was a, a little boy. Seeing the child in danger, a man mounted a horse, risked his life basically to catch up to the wagon and to slow it down. The child was saved, but he grew up to be a very lawless man, and he committed a heinous crime, and he stood trial for it. Now, as the, as the man is in the dock, he recognizes the judge as the, the man who years earlier had actually spared his life. And so the man pleaded for mercy to the judge on the basis of that past experience. You've saved me once. Can you do it again? But the words from the judge silenced the man's plea. Young man, the judge said, Back then, I was your savior. Today, I am your judge, and I sentence you to die. Acts 5 is designed to remind us that God is not just savior, he's also judge. But whenever I read it, I surprise myself because without fail, God's judgment on sin still astonishes me. Am I the only one? Why, I ask myself, am I more shocked that God judges Ananias' sin than I am that in his forbearance he holds back judgment from me? See, when I ask myself this question, I realize, you know what? 
I think I'm more comfortable with God's kindness than I care to admit. And because God is holy, he reminds me, sin will be judged. Let's put this in the context of our relationships. I think that if, if we don't remember the divine purpose of kindness, pushing back judgment, but that God is at one day going to judge, if, if I don't remember that, then it's possible for me to kill with kindness when I fail to acknowledge that there is a time in my relationships where wrong needs to be addressed. Now, in the Bible, God does that, Joshua 7, Acts 5, immediately on a few occasions. At other times, it's over a period of time. With the nations, it's different, but invariably, in God's actions with His people, He does judge the wrong. And I think the problem for many of us is that we're too quick to judge. That's part of the reason why we're doing this series, right? It's not for nothing that if you ask non-church people their opinion of the church, what they'll say is they're judgmental and they're hypocrites, right? That, that's the opinion. So we're doing this because, yeah, you know what? Maybe some of us need to add kindness to our willingness to share the truth. But it's also true that for some of us, we're what I would call kindaholics, a kindaholic is someone who has this uncontrollable love for spreading kindness. A kindaholic has an abnormal desire or a dependence upon being kind. This is abnormal because sometimes it's wrong to hold off addressing someone's behavior, especially when that behavior is hurting or harming someone else. A kindaholic's kindness is deadly. And here's why. It downplays the wrong and it denies the judgment that's coming to each and every person. Our kindness is deadly when its expression ignores this divine foundation. God is holy. Wrong will be judged. So in other words, the kindness that we are supposed to show is never to be kind simply for kindness' sake. We are kind because kindness is a superpower. We are kind because kindness gives people an opportunity to face their wrong. But here's the question. How will they ever face their wrong if we find ourselves in relationships where we refuse to allow God to use us to be the ones to point out that wrong? Yes, we all know the way we do this matters, but kindness of the divine kind always addresses wrong, very rarely immediately, often over time. So the question here is, are you a kindaholic? Do you have an uncontrollable desire to spread kindness to the extent that you rarely, if ever, address wrong? Now, when I was putting this together, I'm thinking, well, nah, I'm married to a German I'm a European, we're way too direct, I'm really good with this. And for the most part, in the church, in the evangelical setting, we're probably okay on this. But then I started to think. And as I started to think about this, I just recognized that there was one relationship in my life where I was guilty of being a kindaholic. And I wouldn't be surprised that even if you look at this and think, that's not me, I actually think that if you were to think about this and think about your relationships, I wouldn't be surprised if most, if not all of us, could probably think of one relationship where we struggle to address the underlying wrong. We struggle with it. So, with that in mind, it, it leads to this thought. Kindness is deadly when it's expressed from a one-dimensional character. In certain situations, a dominant character trait, when allowed to run our lives unchecked, has the potential to turn a character strength into a character weakness. So let me give you an example. I'm a passionate person. It's partly because I'm passionate, it's also because I'm Welsh. You've never been to a sports game unless you've been to a Welsh sports game. It's very difficult for me, even when I watch my kids right now, to remember I'm not in Wales. 
Seriously. I'm just passionate. It's just what we are. Now, passion is a good thing. It keeps me going. It means I never feel that it's too late. I keep pushing. But there's a caveat. If I'm not careful, that passion will keep me driving when, in fact, I need to back up and slow down. I, I've said this before, I have axioms, words that God has given to me, maybe statements from other people, things that God has just placed into my soul, and, and I write them down. And one of those is the word from Benjamin Franklin about passion. He said, if passion drives you, then let reason hold the reins. I can remember that because if I'm not careful, that dominant trait of passion will drive me to the point that my behavior appears to be unreasonable. Just this week, I was talking to Vipka about something that I said was small. And I was sharing with Vipka, and I said, yeah, but it's all fine. And Vipka looked at me in that kind of German way, and she said, wow, there's an awful lot of energy coming out of someone who's fine. <laughs> See, in certain situations, my passion, when it is allowed to drive my life unchecked, turns this strength into a weakness. Because I'm passionate, reason needs to hold the reins. If I don't allow it to, then I am guilty of functioning out of this one, what I'm calling this one-dimensional character trait, this one-dimensional reality. Now, th this is how this thought applies to kindness. One of the top five character traits is agreeableness. Statistically speaking, there are an awful lot of people in this room who have the character trait of being agreeable. This is a good thing. Agreeable people, okay, they actually focus on we, not me. Agreeable people are often happier people because they handle their anger and their negative emotions far better than a lot of us do. Being agreeable is really, really good. But in certain situations, an agreeable person, because they don't have their agreeable nature checked in certain situations, end up being treated like a doormat. They often allow the needs of others to be put above their own, and they tend to give in too easily to other people's preferences. See, as good as agreeableness is, when it allows, is allowed to run your life unchecked, it hurts you. Psychologists say that agreeableness in these wrong moments is often a cover for fear. Some of us rank higher on agreeableness, which means that we may have that leaning towards fear. And as such, there are days when agreeable people prioritize the needs and wants of others over their own because, and get this, they fear the conflict and they fear the loss in the relationship that that conflict that will happen if they address the wrong ever comes up. And so they never bring it up. Now, if this describes you, then essentially what you're doing is you're playing God. Playing God happens when we try to manage someone else's response to the truth. If I'm kind because I'm concerned what will happen if I maturely and correctly present an issue, I am actually putting myself in a position I don't have, managing the world and even managing the world in which I live. I don't have that position. God has that position. And if I do that too much, then nothing gets addressed over time and what happens? Things get worse. And do you know what happens in my life like that? I wake up in the middle of the night, I get cranky because I don't sleep, I have less peace in my life, and I'm less patient with my family. I am harmed as a result of that. See, kindness kills when the goal is not about giving someone an opportunity to right their wrong, but you trying to manage the fallout from their wrong behavior. And what you're doing in a moment like that is you're actually allowing this dominant, this positive cult, uh, character trait, agreeableness, kindness, to actually run your life unchecked. And as a result of that, it actually harms you. But more than that, it doesn't give the person the opportunity to deal with what everyone else knows is the issue. 
I was thinking how to illustrate this. How many of you have ever seen the movie Roxanne? Some of us older folks have seen this, right? Steve Martin. You remember what the problem with Steve Martin was? He had a big nose. I could probably go like this and you'd probably see it magnified by 60 times, right? Well, Steve Martin had this massive nose. And so Daryl Hannah, who plays this kind of person he really likes, right? In the end of the movie, they get together. But in order to get together, Steve Martin has to get over the fact that he's got a big nose. And that this big nose doesn't and shouldn't have the power to control his life. The only problem is everybody in the movie warns her, don't mention his nose. Don't mention his nose. And so the subplot in this story is how people try to manage things by being agreeable to a person who's got an obvious issue and really needs to deal with it. And the person that gets harmed in this are the friends, and it's also Steve Martin. See, when, when we pursue this dominant character trait and don't check it, it can harm us and it can even harm the other person. And again, think about this. Do you think that a person can address their wrong without that wrong being made aware to them? Of course they can't. Who can deal with a problem when they don't know that they have it? Some of us, and I've seen this before, right? Some people will come into my office and say, Pastor, will you pray with me? And he says, things are going wrong in my life, and there must be some get this hidden sin that I don't know of that means that God is punishing me for all of this. I'm like, how can you deal with a sin that you do not know about? Grieving the Holy Spirit, I'll say, is when the Holy Spirit has revealed something in your life that is hindering your intimacy and fellowship with the Father. He wants you to work on it, but you're actually so comfortable with God's kindness that you ain't willing to do it. That grieves the Holy Spirit. But this idea that there's something out there that you don't know about and you therefore uh, you have to confess something that you don't know, I mean, come on, people. That's not the way that works. See, in order to deal with something, something needs to be pointed out. Sometimes God will do that in my life through a quiet time. At other times, he uses Vipka or my kids or people in the church or whatever else it is. But I need people to point out the truth. Now, do I like it when they do? Absolutely not. But when we're so agreeable that we never raise an issue for fear of an outcome that we will never be able to control, I want to say that our kindness is deadly. It kills us, and it also is hurting them too. See, in a sense, our kindness is based upon a deficient theology because God is not only kind, He is holy. God, in His kindness, is forbearance, which means He held back judgment. Why? For us to turn. God is holy too. Our kindness is also idolatry because we're putting ourselves in a position that we don't have. We will never be able to perfectly control all of the outcomes. So does that mean we don't even try? Our kindness is deadly when this is the way our relationships work. And more than that, our relationships are so one-dimensional. I wonder how many marriages are struggling because they're so one-dimensional. You just can't talk about it. Folks, that kind of kindness is deadly. Does that mean to say that you need to talk about it right now, right after the service? No, that's Acts 5, Joshua 7. Maybe that's not the right thing to do. You can kill it that way. But the idea that you don't talk about it at all, that's not divine kindness. A difficult aspect in ministry is when I'm asked to step into a situation because a person's behavior is harming them and it's killing the relationship. There's a truth that I stand on in moments like that because believe me, I don't like doing it. I really don't like doing it. But I, I stand on this truth. It's my job to give people an opportunity to voluntarily acknowledge their wrong now because if they don't acknowledge it voluntarily now, they will acknowledge it involuntarily later. Church, there are two judgments. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, chapter 5, from verse 6, talks about the judgment of believers. Go and read it. Verses 6 to 11. Judged according to what we've done. That's not a judgment for salvation. It's a judgment for rewards. God has blessed us with things that he wants us to use. And if we don't, that's the point of that judgment. 
We, we either acknowledge what we've been given and do good with them now, voluntarily, or, or it'll be involuntarily later. And, and for unbelievers here, those people who haven't realized the power of the sacrifice of Jesus that we'll celebrate at the end of this message, there is going to be a judgment too. We either voluntarily bow the knee to Jesus in this life, or we're told we will do it involuntarily in the next. So as much as I really do not like this aspect of the ministry, the reality is judgment is real. There is a time when the time is up. And I can't shy away from that. See, spiritually speaking, judging and getting involved in arguments, which is often what we fear when it comes to confronting issues, is actually a sign of weak faith. Many of us are reluctant to kind of step into this part of our character that we may be deficient in or not strong in because we're afraid that it will end up in arguments or the whole thing will go south. But I want to tell you, that's actually a sign of weak faith. This is why I say that. It's actually Romans 14, 1 through 4. I'm just going to read verse 1 and verse 4. Have a look at this. Paul says, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Now, if you're reading chapter 13, you realize what it was all about. But the basic point here is, Paul isn't saying don't address the issues. He's not advocating silence. He says, look, don't judge. Don't get involved in quarreling because that's the sign of weak faith. Who are you to judge someone else's servant, Paul says? To their own master, servant, stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. You know what? Everyone is a child of God. To him they must give an account. And so the, the whole idea here is that it, it's not that we should never address the issues, but that we shouldn't judge and we shouldn't quarrel. And part of what we've got to do is figure out a way of actually presenting something without actually getting involved in a slanging match over it. Don't get drawn into quarrels. That's the point. But many of us are so afraid of quarreling that we refuse to highlight the wrong. And for agreeable people, that means that you end up getting treated like a doormat over and over and over again. If that's you, let me encourage you with this thought. Rather than worrying about how to manage the behavior, turn your attention to how you'll navigate the fallout if raising the right issue at the right time, in the right way, goes the wrong way. Rather than focus on how to manage their behavior, start to spend your time focusing on, okay, how am I going to handle this? How am I going to feel if they don't respond the right way? Because remember, you've prayed about it, you've waited for the right time, you've thought about what you're going to say ahead of time, you're not going to get involved in quarreling or arguing, you're just going to state this thing and, and leave this thing to God. How will that make you feel? And if it does go wrong, remember, you cannot control the outcomes. You can't. And if you don't control them, don't own the responsibility for something that is not yours to own. And I know that that's easier said than done. Now, let me try and bring this home with a personal story. This is personal to me. As I've said, I think that even people who have that kind of dominant trait towards, say, truth, may well have a relationship where they function as kindaholics. I had one of those relationships, and the person I struggled with was my own father. My dad wasn't a believer, and his lifestyle choices, let me keep this uh, kind of PG version, just basically led him to make decisions that hurt an awful lot of people, including me. I was intentionally kind to him, but I was afraid of the outcome were I to ever confront how his behavior had hurt people, including me. Now, I had a great reason for avoiding the conversation. At least I thought I did. I convinced myself that I was the only Christian that my dad knew, and if talking to him went wrong, then he'd have no Christians in his life to be Christ for him. So the best thing for me to do was to keep quiet. Sounds good, right? And so you've got to understand that my dad never pursued me. 
When I came to Christ at the age of 11 or 12, I, I remember one time where God told me quite clearly through this prayer time, Craig, I want you to pursue your father. Do you know how difficult it is for a child to deal emotionally with the fact that their biological father doesn't pursue them, that the child has to pursue the father? So in my mind with all of this, there was no way that I was going to uh, try and blow this relationship by saying something that would mean he was likely never to talk to me again. So when it, honestly, when it came to my relationship with my dad, I was just a kind of holic. I never judged him. I never argued with him. Sounds great, but I just never told him when his behavior hurt me and caused him to treat an awful lot of people like doormats, and everyone deserved better behavior than that. Well... God had a plan to turn that around, and it's called a German lady by the name of my wife. Vipka and I hadn't been married that long when dad, on wife number four by this point, was diagnosed with, uh, the, when his wife, Tegwin, was diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer. Now, not long before she died, she discovered that my dad was, di uh, was lying to her. Again, PG version. Rather than come home to his dying wife, my dad pretended to be away on business and stayed a few miles from home. He called her one night, she picked up the phone, dialed 1471, which told her the location of where he was making the call. He was lying, he was committing adultery again. So before she died, the marriage is over, dad wasn't invited to the funeral. No surprise there, right? But I was. Mm. Now I had to decide, should I go? And if I did, was I to tell my dad? We're living in London at this point in time, so I'm thinking, you know what, I could probably just get into London, do the funeral, get back home, nobody would ever know. But my wife points, doing the right thing the wrong way is still wrong. You need to tell your dad. There was nothing in me that wanted to tell my dad because I knew where this would go. This was an outcome I didn't think I could control. Could control. And I thought the consequences of this for my dad's eternity was basically better off, had a better chance of success by me staying quiet. Vipke helped me see that the right thing to do was to talk to him. In a sense, she told me that being agreeable all the time wasn't the divine kind. She didn't use those words, but that's what she said. And she encouraged me to believe that if I did the right thing in the right way for the right reasons, I could trust God with the results. And the question is, was I going to do that? Now, I'd like to tell you I wasn't in ministry at this point. I was still training, but I was. So I called him. And at first, I still remember the call. At first, when I called him, um, we talked the way we always did, and he, was, he loved Formula One, so we talked about Formula One and sport and everything else. And, and then I said, oh, Dad, before I go, I need to tell you something. And I told him, and he didn't respond well. And he tried to blame her and, and everything else. And, of course, I knew he was going to do, try and twist the story around. So I'd already kind of worked through with Vicka what I was going to do. And so I told him how his behavior had disappointed me. It had hurt other people. And that what would happen as a result in our relationship as a result of this call was dependent upon him, not me, because I was still his son and he was still my dad. But his behavior wasn't right. And there's no way that I'm going to allow my relationship with your ex-wife to be damaged through your behavior. You either accept that or, or not. Now, I say it to you calmly, but believe me, as a 25-year-old, I was shaking. I still remember it. To say the relationship went quiet for a little bit of time after that was an understatement. You kind of blanked me for a while. But then, something changed. Birthday card for one of the kids. All of a sudden, he started to open up. And it started to open up because I never missed a birthday. I always gave him a call, tried to give him a call, and it changed. And I think one of the reasons it changed is because I actually added another dimension to our relationship. I added truth to the love. He knew I didn't judge him, but he knew I wouldn't stand for that either. And I honestly believe that there was a part of him that wanted to change, but he was too scared of it. There were times when I honestly wondered whether our relationship would ever develop to the point where I'd be able to share Christ. This was one of the hardest things for me. It's why I pursued him as an 11-year-old boy. So I learned to judge each interaction with my dad, and I think this is going to be the key thought for some of you. You've got relationships like this. I learned to judge each interaction with my dad, not by the results, but by the seeds I got to plant. 
Every time I interacted with my dad, I thought, what seed do I need to plant today? It wasn't about the results. It was just about the seeds. Because I had to plant seeds, and I had to trust that God was going to do what God does. God waters seeds so that seeds grow. They grow because the life is in God. The life is in the seed. That's the way God created things. See, if I looked at the fruit of our relationship on its own, I'd have been downcast. I, I, I was in the middle 20s. I had two kids, okay? I was pastoring in a church when I first had the courage to actually tell my dad the truth. It took me 25 years, and I, I'm looking at this thinking, if, if I look at this relationship now, I'm just going to be despondent. If I look at the, the fruit, I'm going to be despondent. And so I had to learn to look at the future differently. In my most despondent moments, I'd think of the future as kind of the continuation of the past. If something drastic doesn't happen right now, everything is going to break. I'd look at it as a continuation of the past. But if I realized if I judged my dad that way, then he'd never, ever have a different future. And you know why? Divine kind actions begin with kind thoughts. Divine kind actions actually begin with kind thoughts. And I tried sowing seeds of honesty, of deeper conversations, even of my own wrestles with every interaction I had with my dad. And, and then with us living further away, I lived in London and then we went to Germany and then later on we went over to the States in Tampa. It, it, it would often cause me to think, will this thing ever change? But it did. With every interaction with my dad, he would share more of his wrestles to the, to the point where at the end of his life, not only did I have the opportunity to share with him, Dad, you're going to see Jesus soon, and when you do, your sin will be judged. He didn't want that. And sometimes when you talk to people like that and they're on their deathbed, it's like, uh, what are they more afraid of? 11th hour conversions, right? They're real, but it's like, and I, and I looked at him and I said, Dad, if you're really serious here, this is what you need to do. You've got three other kids, right? Three step kids. And I said, their relationship with you is messed up. For as long as God gives you breath, the fruit of your repentance has to be that you're going to try and do what you need to do to get this relationship right. See how far that relationship came? But it took me 15 years to get to that point. And see, for some of us, we're in this kindaholic relationship with the one person that we'll never be able to address the truth to. We've got to take a different view on every interaction. Rather than looking at the fruit, we need to just be content to sow the seeds and allow God to do the rest. And when you share something that's troubling, yeah, it may go silent for a while, but keep being kind. Don't judge. Don't quarrel. Stick there. Stay with it. Don't give up. It took me 15, 20 years with my dad. I don't know how long it'll take you, but I do know this. The life is in the seed. Now, let me begin to wrap this up. Much of the series has been talking about how we need to add what I would call loving kindness, has said, to truth. <clears throat> Sadly, because the way that the church is portrayed is often more judgmental than loving. But there is a sense in which for some of us, and probably for all of us in at least one relationship, we may well need to add truth to love. And I want to say this is a growth process. And I love this verse in Ephesians 4.15. Look at that first word, instead. Instead. Instead of what? Instead of verse 14. Verse 14 describes what immature people are like. Verse 15 is a, is a challenge to, for us to grow into maturity. The instead is verse 14. Verse 14 is immature people. Immature people are manipulated by cunning people who take advantage of them. It actually says cunning people. The word cunning means people who throw a dice. In other words, instead of being conned by people who will take whatever chance they can get with you, we're to grow into maturity. And the marker of that growth is what? Instead, speaking the truth in love. Instead of being conned, instead of being manipulated, mature people know how to speak the truth in love. The marker of growth is exactly this. Now, we're doing this kindness project because we sense that this is an area where we all need to grow in. But I want to talk about, as we wrap this up, how this growth happens. 
How did I grow? Well, firstly, I grew because Vipka was kind of that support that held my arms up, and she was with me the whole time. In doing this series, we've said that, hey, some of you, as we go through this, a light may be shining on one particular relationship, just one relationship, that God wants you to improve. And we want to come alongside you. And that's why when we start this kindness challenge in November, 30 days of being kind in one relationship, some of you are going to have a relationship like I had with my dad that you need to work on, and we want to help you with that. If that is you, then please connect with us. It happened for me because I had somebody who walked with me. But secondly, it, had, it worked for me because I was willing to work on learning the truth. I'm not God. I can't control every outcome. I have character defects that I am very uh, comfortable with. I can't point out someone else's without being willing to work on my own. There are resources, there are materials in the Kindness Project. Again, go to our website. You will discover uh, resources for that too. But these are, what I want to share now is these things are, are kind of supplementary things. There's something more foundational to our growth than what I've just shared. It's how growth happens. That word grow here, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow, is the word oxano. Oxano. It means to give increase, to cause to grow, to enlarge. The implication is that for someone or something to grow, it must be acted upon by an outside power, or have life within itself. Remember what I said about my relationship with my dad? I start looking at the results, and I start thinking, how am I going to plant the seeds? Why did I do that? Because God brings the increase. God brings the increase. The life is in the seed. Life is in the seed. God brings the increase. And so this is what Oxano means. So think about it. Other uses of Oxano, the lilies of the field, Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Oxano, or seeds planted, they grew, oxano. All of these living things grew because there was an element of divine life implanted within them. The lilies don't grow by themselves. Seeds don't produce fruit by themselves. They grow because they have, from the very beginning, been implanted with life from God. Now, here's the point. You may feel incapable of ever seeing growth in your ability to balance love and kindness in one particular relationship. You may feel that it is impossible for the person who you need to be kind to for them to ever change. But I want to tell you something. There is a living human spirit in you that has been implanted by God. You may have given up any hope that you can change your, your life, that your relationships can change, but that reckons without the life of God. Growth is possible. To be human is to grow. Look at this verse. This is of Jesus. Luke 2.40. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the what? Grace of who? Why does God's grace need to be on God? Because the Son of God didn't become a man in order to act like God. I've said this before. But to act like the sons and the daughters of God should have acted, but because of the controlling power of sin, we couldn't. This word grow, Jesus grew. Why did he grow? Oh, because he's God. No, because he's human. The word grew is the imperfect tense of Oxano. Jesus grew in his humanity because there was a living human spirit in him, just as there is a human spirit in each and every one of you. Jesus, just like any other child, was growing into human maturity because he's a living person, and his living or human spirit was being strengthened constantly. The man Jesus was being filled with wisdom and divine favor to the extent that his physical growth was equal to his growing realization of who he truly was. Friends, in the same way, you are filled with wisdom and divine favor to the extent that your physical growth can be equal to the growing realization that no matter what issues you wrestle with, Jesus on the cross destroyed the power of sin. You now can grow in the divine kind. Your dominant trait doesn't have to define you. You can do something supernatural to the point where the supernatural kindness can actually be natural. 
Do not doubt it. This is possible for you because you have been implanted with life from God. Change is possible. And I honestly believe with all of my heart that if the church embraced the real meaning of kindness, it is possible in the emerging season for people to look at the church and to change their mind from judgmental to kind. Why? Because the life of God is in his body. So is that it? Is that all we need to do? Just grow? No. Have a look at this word here. And Jesus grew, the first one was Luke 2.40, this one's Luke 2.52. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with what? God and man. He grew in this. From the outside, you look at this in English and you think it's the same word, right? It's not the same word. This word is a different Greek word. It's prokopto. Jesus grew. It means he advanced, he progressed. It has the idea of progress. Jesus grew in Luke 2.52, not because he was a living human being and because living human beings grow. No, he grew because he made a conscious effort to put his progressing in favor with other people as his top priority. That's how he grew. He consciously chose. Jesus was not a kindaholic. He grew in the divine kind of life because he consciously chose to submit himself to what God says, prokopto. Jesus grew because he was self-motivated, because he consciously chose to partner with the divine life within him. Let me ask you, will you be willing to put the same conscious effort into growing in the divine kind? If you do that, the life of God, if you're a follower of Jesus, is within you. That's the wonder of the cross. That, that's the wonder of, of this, this act that we're about to celebrate. See, in going to the cross, Jesus made a conscious effort to picture what was happening here today, to picture a day when a redeemed humanity, people who've understand, understood who he is, what he'd done, would gather together realizing they can do this because the thing that marks them out as different from people who have not is that now they can consciously choose to partner with the divine life within them. The difference between you and me because we're in Jesus is that now we have the choice. If we partner with God, submit to what he says, listen to the voice of the Spirit when the Spirit says, you know what, you're being too kind here. You do realize you're being treated like a doormat again. You do realize you've got more value than that. And then you respond by saying, but God, I'm afraid of where this thing will go. Well, don't, be, don't, don't try and be me. Don't control the outcomes. Just start to pray about the right time and the right way to actually deal with this thing and, and trust me with the results. Do you know why you can do that? Because Jesus died on the cross and actually made it possible for you to live in faith, not fear. It's possible for us to partner with God to grow in kindness. And so I, for one, refuse to accept that it will always be the case that the church will be considered jump, uh, judgmental and hypocritical. I think if we start to realize that we need to be as comfortable with God's judgment on sin as we are comfortable with his kindness, there'll be balance in our own lives that will cause us to be more radical on dealing with our own stuff that will mean that we're more compassionate in helping other people deal with theirs. I think it's because we're so comfortable with kindness that we actually forget to show it. And so what I want us to do, I'd like you to, to take the elements and we're going to take of the bread and the cup today thanking God that Jesus made a conscious effort to free us from the controlling power of sin. Now if you look at this, there are two parts to this. These things are fun, I know, right? The first part is the film at the top. So what I'd like you to do is to just peel back the film at the top and that will expose the, the, the way for the bread. And then if you have that, what I'd like you to do is just to, to take it in your hands and just to remember on the night that he was betrayed, if you, if you need any, you can put up your hands and our team here would uh, 
we'll be glad to give you some. So we're taking this today, remembering that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, conscious choice, that it's broken for you. And why did he do it? Because he knew that in that one sacrifice, you and I could be put right with God. The body of Christ broken for you. Take now and eat in remembrance of him. In the same way we read after supper, he took the cup and this is where we pull back the foil. He gave it to his disciples, telling them that this cup was the new covenant in his blood. You see, when Jesus' blood shed, it cleansed us from all guilt, all shame. Everything we've ever done, everything we'll ever do. All we need to do is to keep coming back, keep coming back. There's one sacrifice once for all time, the blood of Christ that was shed for you. Take now and drink in remembrance of him. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love. But Father, we don't really understand this love until we recognize that you're not just kind, you're also holy. And Father, the reason that Jesus died was that you not only delay judgment, you actually put the judgment of sin on him. All of our wrong placed on him. And so Father, we thank you that we are amongst those who are voluntarily chosen to thank you, to acknowledge our wrong while we live. But God, at the same time, we recognize that we all know an army of people who've not done that yet. And so God, we pray that in our own hearts, in our own lives, that you would help us balance your holiness with your love. And Father, even as we engage in this last song, this song written on the idea that the people ascend, the song of ascent, they ascend to you in worship. Father, I pray that we will continue to make that choice over and over and over again to worship you for who you are and for what you've done. God, we thank you. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the new creations that we are. And God, we pray that you would help us grow in maturity so that we would be able to reflect the divine kind in all of our relationships. In Jesus' name.